And now I'm turning, and now I turn it over to you, Juliet. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Hello, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your Saturday afternoon. I saw in the chat that some people are from frozen places. Uh, I am in suburban Baltimore, Maryland, where it was 12 degrees this morning, which is about as as cold as our winters ever get. Um, I completely agree with what Susie says that the silver lining for me of these ongoing Zoom times is the opportunity to, for people who love Jane Austen to come together from all around the world and not just once or twice, but again and again and again. So thank you. Um, and just to echo Susie, um, question and answer is always my favorite part of any talk. I'll do the best to make what comes before that interesting as well today, um, but certainly ask your questions in the chat and let's get to as many as we can. Special welcome to students from Ole Miss. Um, our spring semester at Goucher starts in just over a week, so my students are off the hook on being here today. Um, I'm going to share my screen and here we go. Um, when Susie asked me to speak for the Jane Austen and the Pan Pacific Symposium last fall, I said no. I said I couldn't. And I never say no. I always say yes. But I said no because I was working on finishing this book and I didn't want to talk about anything that was unrelated to it. I'm so glad that Susie persuaded me to present about the translations in the Jane Austen collection at Goucher because I learned a lot from doing so. Um, it's benefited our work at Goucher for me to know more about that. And also, um, just wanted to recap extremely briefly. If you missed that presentation, it looked a little bit like this. And I believe you can find that talk on the Jasmine Southwest YouTube page. Susie also very kindly said, oh, thank you for talking about translations. Come back sometime in January and talk about whatever you like. So that is an unusual kind of blank check to be offered as a speaking topic. Usually people um, ask for something in particular. So I said, and I'll go back so you can see his lovely face again. I said, I want to talk about Oscar Faye Adams. And I want to be absolutely frank with you. The only way that anyone was going to invite me to talk about Oscar Faye Adams was if I invited myself to talk about Oscar Faye Adams because hardly anyone has heard of him. He sounds boring. He might even look boring. That is what I thought at first. Before I get to why Oscar Faye Adams is not in fact boring, why he's really important and why we should all read him. I will give a very brief introduction to the Austin Collection at Goucher. So greetings from us here in Towson, Maryland, just north of Baltimore City. Um, Susie mentioned, in case you don't know us, we are a world-renowned Jane Austen collection. We are that, no, we have that in our library. Um, thanks to the bequest of our founding donor, a 1928 alumna of Goucher, whose name was Alberta Hirschheimer Burke. And I'm often asked, well, what's in this collection? What's the range? What's the extent? So this is my little summary of that. We have first rare and illustrated editions of Austin's novels. Susie mentioned translations. I mentioned translations. We have lots of those and more all the time. Um, Alberta Burke was especially interested in visualizing Jane Austen's world, as many of us are too. And so she collected um, illustrated publications from Jane Austen's lifetime on subjects such as landscape, architecture, and fashion. She also assembled scrapbooks with 20th century ephemera, most of which exists nowhere else at all. And as Susie mentioned, we are also fortunate to have the archives of Jasna, which are growing all the time. And the page you see here is from our very good looking new website, which we're very proud of. So we so encourage you to visit that and come back and visit it again as we build more content for it over time. You can also find out more about the Jane Austen collection at Goucher from this article in the fall Jasmine News. And we, let's see, my curator colleague Kristen Welsenbach and I um, presented a special interest session at the AGM, a short version of which is in the AGM on demand um, in, in this little, looks like this when you go to it. And then finally, I sound like I'm advertising myself, but this is all to pique your interest, all of you, um, perhaps in different ways, depending on your different interests. The breakout session I gave at the AGM was published in Persuasions Online um, just last month in December, and it is focused on Alberta's Austin collecting in conjunction with her long, um, decades long friendship with an English woman and art artist and art teacher named Averill Hassel. So, I'm happy to share that. It has lots of pictures. That's the great thing about publishing and persuasions online. You can have almost all the pictures that you want. 
should you be interested in supporting our ongoing work at Goucher, our website does include this page with some information about contacting us and donating materials or donating, donating money. Um, and I wanted to just say briefly, in the JASMA archives alone, we have recently received a gift of personal correspondence and papers from Juliet McMaster. She presented this gift to us at the AGM. It was quite dramatic. And I have also just completed, um, under the auspices of the JASMA Archives and History Committee, an oral history interview with Juliet, which will join other oral history interviews with founding members of JASMA deposited in the archives. So growing all the time. Our next project at Goucher is on sense and sensibility. To tie in with this year's AGM theme, we will be adding sense and sensibility resources to our website and also sharing them with you, we hope, in Victoria. So we truly appreciate your ongoing support. So j Knights love a quiz. We know this, we love quizzes. I have a quiz for you. You can put your answers in the chat if you would like, or you can keep them to yourself. And I'm not gonna linger on these. So whatever comes to the top of your mind, just think that or let us know that. If there are students with us, um, think of this as the pre-assessment. Who created the first critical edition of Austin's novels? Who created the first critical biography of Jane Austen? Who published the first contemporary photographs of sites associated with Jane Austen's life? Who was the American entrusted by English organizers to fundraise for the stained glass memorial window to Austen in Winchester Cathedral? And you might by this point suspect that this is not a very interesting quiz at all, and that all the answers are Oscar Faye Adams, or at least I am here to persuade you, to convince you, to offer evidence and persuade you that the answer to all those questions is Oscar Faye Adams, even if you don't think that it is at this point. If you still think that I'm wrong, by the time we get to the Q&A, let's hash it out then. And I also, I promise, I will explain what I mean. I will define my terms. What do I mean by a critical edition? What do I mean about by a critical biography? If you were saying, well, who did it? Depends on what you mean by that. Of course, you are right, it does. This is an illustrated talk. That is the good news. The bad news is that a lot of the images are in black and white and they are of poor quality because that's how they were originally published, cheaply. We speak of print culture. And when you think of print culture during the decades that Oscar Faye Adams was publishing on Jane Austen in the 1880s and 1890s. You might think of grainy photographs, crumbly old magazines. There's one on the left, crumbly old the Cosmopolitan. Um, they kind of smell by now, presumably they didn't when they were young and they were probably more beautiful. Um, not very beautiful looking books. So I've decided to do something in this presentation that I have never done before. I will break things up as we go with some beautiful, colorful images of Jane Austen sites from my photo role in July 2017, when I was in England to attend a conference commemorating the 200th anniversary of her death. So just when you think I can't take any more late 19th century grainy black and white photographs, I promise I will refresh us with something. And I think we all need some armchair travel right now. I might have needed it for years. So here's an example of what I have in mind. So refreshing, one view of the garden at Jane Austen's house in Chawton. And in my defense, these images are not totally unconnected with my main subject, because as we'll see, Oscar Faye Adams was himself a dedicated Jane Austen tourist, or you might say literary pilgrim. And he visited many of these sites himself in the late 1880s, 1890s. We will look at those photographs too. And I also have that 2017 trip to thank for bringing Oscar Faye Adams to my attention. I'll say more about that in a moment. Keep looking at this beautiful garden just for a sec. The research that I'm going to show um, there's still more to be discovered. I'm going to tell you some of the stories of that process and I'm going to do so for several reasons. First, I often find that JASNA members are curious about the part of my work that sounds like literary detection, finding things out, uncovering sources, where I look, how one discovery leads to the next, what I say in the reading room when I turn over a page and there's something great, what I say is I kind of yelp, just so you know. 
Um, and for me, sharing my excitement at making discoveries with you in this way is one way to help bring alive topics that are in danger of being a little bit dull or dusty. Also, while this is not an academic talk, such as I would give at a scholarly conference, I am mindful that there are students and fellow researchers in the audience, and many of you are on your own research journeys. Perhaps you would benefit about hearing about this one of mine. I have been concerned for a while about establishing how we know what we know about Austin reception. So we know this fact, but where do we know this fact from? What is the document that carries this fact to us? And if you attended my breakout on Northanger Abbey, a history and documents at the 2019 AGM, or the breakout I gave at the, the previous year's AGM from Emma and Persuasion, you saw me do that kind of work with respect to those novels. What are the letters? What are the ledgers? What are the records that have conveyed to us what we know about the publication of those two novels? And another case in point was the very short article that I wrote in Persuasion several years ago on Henry Austin's authorship of the 1817 biographical notice. Everyone called him the author, but how did we know he was the author? That was the question that motivated that short piece. So how did I come to be interested in Oscar Faye Adams? I have a book project in progress. It's the one in the middle. Its tentative title is Americans for Austin. And I am investigating how Austin studies began in America, thanks to the visionary work of outsiders to the academic establishment. And I think I need to retool that little description a little bit because the, the part of it that's really a novel argument, a new argument is, has to do with the comma after began. So I am going to make the very bold claim that Austin studies as we understand it today in the whole world began in America, not just this is how Austin studies began in America, as opposed to where it began other places. I believe, and I believe I can prove that it began in America, and we can be justly proud of that. This book takes place chronologically where my previous book, Reading Austin in America, left off. That book took us through the 1860s, and this book picks up a little bit later, 1880s, and ends in 1979 the year that Jasna was founded, not by coincidence. And for students and professors in the audience, maybe this fact was at your fingertips, but I had to look it up. Our Modern Language Association was founded in 1883. So that was when professions of literary studies and allied disciplines were starting to call themselves academic disciplines and develop everything that goes with, along with that. Oscar Faye Adams will be the subject of my first chapter. So far, each one of my books has led to the next. This is a paragraph that I wrote at the end of Reading Austin in America. I looked back at it the other day and I thought, oh boy, little did I know. Um, I hope that the stories that I brought to light in Reading Austin in America inspire others to seek out further traces of Austin's historical readers, both in the US and around the world. Clues to these readers' experiences await discovery in the margins of books, as well as in personal letters and journals publishing records, library records, and long forgotten treatments of Austin in print. That is the phrase that's really haunting me now. It's like, yes, in fact, I had no idea. Long forgotten treatments of Austin in print merit study too as evidence of how Austin's novels have circulated and how they have been publicly discussed. Through such investigations, we can continue to develop a richer understanding of Austin's widespread influence and remarkable legacy. Happily, I did the majority of the research that I'm sharing today in 2018 and 2019, that is, before all the libraries and archives closed. The situation now in many places is that you can request digital images of items in collections, often for free, but that is only helpful if you know what you want to see. And the kind of research that I've been doing involves a lot of browsing, flipping, you know, folders and folders and boxes and boxes, maybe there's something in there. Maybe there's not, but there would be no way for me to order digital images of everything in order to find um, what some people have described as my one needle in the haystack. For Oscar Faye Adams, this evidence is scattered for three reasons. One is he was not a famous man. He's not one of these people who was famous in his own day, but we just forgot about him. No, no, he was not famous in his own day. And it was in no one's interest to collect his papers or buy them for a library. He was not the kind of figure who would have merited that treatment in his life or upon his death. 
also, and this is crucial too, he had no direct descendants. He did not marry. I will come back to that fact. His sister outlived him and she gave some of his papers to the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Massachusetts. And these are a couple of images of his, from his scrapbook. And the final reason is that business records of the publishing firms that Adams worked with either don't survive at all or they survive in very incomplete form. And that's just the luck of the draw in terms of survival. One of the th first things that you do in a project like this is look for the archives of the publishing house because if you're fortunate and they survive, ledgers will show how many copies of a title were printed. They might show how much the author was paid, how fast the book sold. There might be incoming letters from the author explaining the evolution of the project. There might be copies of outgoing letters from editors to tell you about how that book changed or how it came to be. In the case of Adams's books about Austin, nothing relevant is to be found in the publisher's archives, at least so it seems a project like this you can't make claims that no one will ever find anything but i have looked hard and so far have not found anything i first found my way towards austin oscar bay adams thanks to Catherine sutherland the distinguished oxford professor who will be known to many of us as one of the keynote speakers on the juvenilia at 2020's virtual agm for 2017 this is one of my shots from that summer the big bicentennial year of jane austen's death Catherine co-curated with Louise West of Jane Austen's house an exhibition titled The Mysterious Miss Austen in Winchester, and perhaps some of you were able to see that. Um, Winchester is the beautiful cathedral city where Austen died and where she is buried. Major pilgrimage site for me and everyone. We'll see some pictures later on. Uh, they paid me, I think, an unintentional compliment <laughs> by choosing the, head, the header for this room of the show. Um, displaying samples of Austin collections, Everybody's Jane. That looked familiar to me, I thought. I've seen that phrase before. Um, Catherine asked to borrow for this show one of Goucher's copies of Oscar Faye Adams's biography of Jane Austen, The Story of Jane Austen's Life. And you will have to trust me that that is the book that the arrow is pointing to because my little snapshot does not show you what's inside it at all. I did not anticipate when I was taking these quick photos of, of, the, of the exhibition that I might use it for this purpose. And I must confess, it's not, not a shameful confession. By no means have I looked at every book in Goucher's Jane Austen collection. No one has. Um, I knew Oscar Faye Adams's name. That was about all. So as I was thinking about my next work on Austen's American readers, I started digging. Who was this Oscar Faye Adams? He lived from 1855 to 1919. He was born in Worcester, Mass. He was educated at the New Jersey State Normal College, meaning Teachers College. That institution is now known as the College of New Jersey. He edited many reference works, including a brief handbook of English authors, in which he, of course, has an entry for Austin. He wrote poetry and short stories that, this is my carefully phrased um, judgment of them, they have not stood the test of time. Oh, they're terrible. I mean, they're, they're just awful. If you read that, you would conclude this man could have nothing good to say about Jane Austen, but you would be wrong. But I'm not advocating that we rehabilitate him as a poet and short story writer. He was a member and secretary of the Boston Authors Club, an organization to which he was intensely devoted. And okay, I wrote gay question mark. And I chose that way to open this topic because that is how my students, my undergraduate students, describe what they know about historic figures, um, such as I asked students in my Virginia Woolf class last fall, what do you know about Virginia Woolf? And they all said, gay question mark. For Oscar Faye Adams, that is the aspect of him about which we know the least. And the aspect of presenting him that I am still thinking and very carefully about and, and working on. Um, the only personal private letters of Oscar Faye Adams's that have survived are a set of about a dozen very emotionally intimate letters that he wrote to George Edward Woodbury, a poet who was best known for the biography he wrote of Edgar Allan Poe. What to make, what to conclude from the tone and content of those letters and the absence of any other real information about this man's personal life as opposed to his professional life. As I said, I'm still working on that. Who was Oscar Faye Adams not? 
he was not Daniel Day-Lewis portraying Cecil Weiss in the 1985 film, A Room with a View. Boy, they kind of look the same though. Ooh. Uh, you can see that the costume designers and perhaps even Day Lewis himself were inspired by an Anglo-American type of the late 19th century. I don't think it's a coincidence. If you know that film backwards and forwards, as I definitely do, the line that you remember is George Emerson saying to Lucy Honeychurch of the character Cecil Vise, he's the sort who can't know anyone intimately, least of all a woman. Um, the line is different in Forster's novel. That's not our topic, so I need to stop digressing. Adams was not that person. In particular, Adams was not from a privileged or well-connected family. He was not educated at an elite university. No, he had a teaching college degree. He was not himself a college or university professor. He did public lecturing. He taught here and there, um, but he didn't have you know, a kind of credentialed appointment in the academic establishment. He was not a best-selling author. We don't have, um, as I said, the lack of publishing records makes it hard to establish exactly how well some of his books sold, but I will show you um, surviving documents a little bit later that make it clear how hard he had to hustle um, for his biography of Jane Austen. He was not wealthy, on the contrary. He was a man of letters in the sense that he lived by his pen, but he did not have great success in his lifetime. He knew successful and wealthy people. He was very, he was networked. He was well-connected. He was on the edge of academic and wealthy worlds in Cambridge and Boston, Massachusetts, but he was not an insider to those worlds. Whenever I gesture, I lose my little, I lose my little arrow, there it comes back. So the pictures that I'm gonna show you from the first of Adams's books on Austin, chapters from Jane Austen, these are from the Google Books digitized version. So any you can, this is one of the ways that you can read Oscar Faye Adams. There are no republished modern versions of his books. There are some um, facsimile printings, you know, bound in leather here and there that you can find. I have not been able to find an original copy of Chapters from Jane Austen um, to buy for myself. It doesn't seem to be out there. Goucher has two copies, um, but access is not so easy right now. Um, and as far as the date goes, you see on the title page, 1889. On the copyright page, the date is 1888. And so I have decided when there is a book that's, that has two dates that I'll just mention both of those dates. So this book was published in 1888 slash nine. You can see at the top of the title page here, the Cambridge series of English classics. Well, this sounds very grand. I was curious to know who else was in the Cambridge series of English classics. And so I discovered that apparently this series consisted of only two books, this one and someone else's book on Walter Scott. And both of these books uh, seem to have been intended by their publisher to appeal chiefly to school children. And certainly the Walter Scott one is very much, you know, Oh, children, Walter Scott was so wonderful. You know, here are some excerpts and I hope you will go read Walter Scott. But Oscar Faye Adams took a very different tack in introducing Jane Austen, as I will show you. The importance and originality of this book is not necessarily discernible from its table of contents. Introduction, Jane Austen, Miss Austen's genius, the uniform quality of Miss Austen, it looks kind of deadly. Um, alternation of dramatis personae in a novel followed by chapters from the novel. It looks like this is just excerpts with some lists of characters. So how can I call this the first critical edition? Why would I call this the first critical edition of Austen's novels? These four reasons. Adams worked on establishing a correct text for the novels. He compared different editions that were available to him. He wanted to correct what he thought were misprints. He wanted to present his readers with as accurate a text as possible. He also wrote footnotes. He provided footnotes or endnotes in some cases, explaining terms and references and context to his American readers. And you will see this over and over again. He's extremely conscious of his audience. I mentioned that he had been a teacher and a lecturer, and you see that. He has a very good sense for what his fellow Americans might be confused by either because it's a reference that's very English or it's a reference that's very 1810s or it's both. And he doesn't condescend at all. I really respect him for this. He explains things very you know, person to person so that you will understand and appreciate Austen's novels better. 
Adams also cited and responded to prior interpretations of Austin's works. He was well informed. He was scholarly. He knew what others prior to him had written and he made sure to acknowledge them. And he also built on those ideas. And he provided the first ever bibliography of prior published sources. This is a big deal. He was enabling scholarly work, new next scholarly work on Austin and no one had done this before. Um, I, I think I was particularly attuned to the aspect of his work that involved explaining things without condescension to contemporary readers, because that's exactly the kind of work that I thought of myself doing in my two editions for Penguin Classics that Susie mentioned in the introduction, um, Emma and Persuasion with the beautiful covers by the Brooklyn artist Dadu Shin. So we use the, the term public humanities today to describe the kind of talk I'm giving right now a talk about an academic author or a literary author, but not to an academic audience and not with academic jargon, not with you know, the, the ways that scholars might talk to each other. Oscar Faye Adams was doing public scholarship, public humanities scholarship. It wasn't called that, but that's what he was doing too. In the preface that he wrote in chapters for Jane Austen, he, he explained that he was going to include the footnotes. That's the first arrow there. Um, he mentioned the bibliography that he included, and he mentioned the textual work that he had done by comparing the editions of Austin that were available to him. He did not have access to the first editions. So it's, I'm not saying that his textual work stands the test of time, but he did what he could, and he was the first to do that. Here are just a couple examples um, of footnotes that he wrote for chapters to Jane, from Jane Austen, so you can get a sense of what I mean. He mentioned apropos of Austen's servants. As you see, the allusions to servants in Miss Austen's novels are comparatively few, but they are of such a nature as to lead one to believe that she could have drawn very entertaining characters of the kind had she so chosen. Such outlined sketches of servants as she does give us are very clear and distinct. I think we would generally agree with that today. The second excerpt, and it gets a little um, weird in the middle, and that's a, a a visual effect from the Google digitization. Um, first, he explains what a wilderness is. You, if you were an American, you definitely would be thinking of wilderness as in like that stuff that's out West that we Americans are building our national identity around rather than um, the part of the garden that's no neglected on purpose. So it seems a little bit more wild. And I also wanted to share with you his, it's not an explanation of Lady Catherine, it's kind of a tiny little critical lecture on Lady Catherine. He wrote, Lady Catherine de Bourgh's insolence of manner has been considered by some critics as much exaggerated, but it must be borne in mind that she was a narrow-minded person with an overweening sense of her own importance and that she was in the company of people whom she regarded as immeasurably her inferiors in social position. To the arrogance and impertinence of such a woman under these circumstances, the endurance of her victims could be the only limit. I think we would probably agree with that too. Here is the bibliography and um, that Adams put at the end of his book. Again, it might not look super impressive to you. It's certainly not as comprehensive as you would be able to, to build today, but it was the first such effort to help other readers and scholars find previously published information about Jane Austen, um, starting with letters, moving to biographical treatments, um, Pellew's dissertation on Austen's novels, the first piece of scholarship of that kind, all the periodical and magazine coverage, um, et cetera, et cetera, going on. So it, it can be the case that we take for granted today that everyone has always known what these sources were and what existed about Austen, but truly people didn't know until someone like Oscar Faye Adams put resources like, like this together. And of course, a bibliography of Jane Austen now is a huge book plus supplements every year. It's not just two pages. It's long ago that that was the case. All right, we're gonna take a break. Here's another view of Jane Austen's garden, that, or rather the garden at the Jane Austen house at, at Chawton. So who would you say gets credit for the first critical edition of Austen's novels? since I bet most of you did not say Oscar Faye Adams, unless you already guessed that I had a, the most boring quiz ever. Typically, R.W. Chapman, 
would get credit for the first critical edition of Jane Austen um, for the Clarendon Press of, of Austen. And this is a fact that I find sometimes is new to JASNA members, but it's so interesting and important. This was long credited with being the first critical edition of any English novelist. R.W. Chapman's work put the novel into the study of literature, whereas previously the novel had been that thing you read for fun or maybe some moral improvement. He ushered Austen in to scholarly and university study, or so it has been said. He drew on the 1913 edition of Pride and Prejudice by Catherine Metcalf, um, who later became Mrs. Chapman. And if you are interested about that story, Catherine Sutherland has written about that, as has Janine Vargas. The first critical biography of Austen, I am now making the case, is Adams's book, The Story of Jane Austen's Life, first published in 1891. And this one is available on Google Books, the 1891 edition, it's easy to find. And that is, you could read it there, there are copies out there. Um, sometimes they're very ambitiously priced, sometimes not. If you have a, a great big city public library that still has all of its 19th century books, if they've managed to avoid being weeded, you might find them there. I am, I am asserting that this is a critical biography and the first such because Adams undertook original research. Also, he systematically reviewed and synthesized prior published sources on Austen's life. He offered fresh interpretations of Austen's life and works, and he loved his bibliographies. He included one for this as well. The two prior biographies of Austen that relied on primary sources and oral history, family reminiscence, were on the left, a memoir of Jane Austen by her nephew J.E. Austen Lee, vicar, and Lord Braeburn's edition of Jane Austen's letters. And you might think, oh, that was just the letters, but Braeburn wrote a multi-chapter biographical treatment of Austen at the beginning of his first volume. And James Edward Austen Lee, Edward Lord Braeburn were parts of different branches of the Austen family. Um, and again, Catherine Sutherland is the one who's written most fully about this. When Cassandra Austen, Jane's surviving sister, divided up manuscripts and letters and gave some to this niece, some to that niece, um, and when objects and relics possessed, possessed by Austen were inherited by, passed down different branches of the family, um, it was the case that these different branches didn't necessarily know which the other had, what the other had, and they didn't draw on each other's materials um, when, when putting forth their own portrayals of Aunt Jane or ultimately Great Aunt Jane. And they were, I should say, Austin, James Edward Austen Lee, publishing in 1870, Braeburn in 1884, their readers were Victorians, their readers were late Victorians, and so certainly these depictions of Jane Austen and her, her life and her writings are very much geared towards what the family wanted to say about her for an audience that was not Regency people, um, but, but much people whose ideas about uh, manners in some cases were quite different than would have been the case in Jane Austen's day. In Oscar Faye Adams's preface to the story of Jane Austen's life, he calls attention to that original research that I mentioned and also um, not just his eyewitness travel, but the people he talked to and the help that he received from them. So you can see at the, in the bottom where the first arrow is, the summer of 1889 was spent by the writer in visiting all the localities once familiar to Jane Austen, and the descriptions of Bath, Steventon, Chawton, and other places can therefore be said to have the merit of accuracy at least. It was originally designed to insert a number of views of localities mentioned, but the difficulty of satisfactorily reproducing these reluctantly obliged the author to forego this intention. So this 1891 edition has no illustrations of these Austin places, but Oscar Faye Adams is letting his readers know that he really wanted to include those, he just couldn't. He was the first person, believe it or not, again, first person who went around visiting places associated with Jane Austen's life and works, not just for a personal pilgrimage purpose, as Americans had certainly done, but with the aim of describing those places to readers of his biography, chiefly Americans for whom English places would not 
be as familiar as they would be to English people, perhaps. And then the second arrow points you to, you, mean, you might say he's name dropping, he is, but he's also acknowledging that he was trusted. He gained the trust of Austin collateral descendants who told him stories, showed him material objects, took him places, gave him access. So he, he was able to, to bring really original material into this biography. And he especially mentions Lord Brayburn, as you see Augustus, Augustus Austin Lee and Montague G. Knight, Esquire of Chawton House. More about Montague Knight shortly. Um, here's an excerpt from the story of Jane Austen's life um, from his pr prelude, as he puts it. And this encapsulates one of his central original arguments about Jane Austen that was really unusual for his time and really appealing to us now. He did not see Jane Austen, he did not present Jane Austen as someone who didn't have the opportunity to marry, poor her, or didn't have much recognition in her lifetime, poor her. He really stressed how much joy she found in her family and her work and how satisfied she seemed to be by the, the encouragement she received. He wrote, as you see, she surely stands in no need of our regretful sympathy, this woman of talent, cut off from early exi earthly existence in the early dawning of an ever brightening renown. Life had already brought her large measure of happiness and affection. She had been able to exercise the gift that was hers with little hindrance, and she had met with approval of her work in quarters where approbation was helpful and stimulating. She did not feel that her abilities were unappreciated or overlooked, nor were they. So this is very different from the, oh, dear Aunt Jane, she just loved to write. She wasn't thinking about her career kind of portrayal that had that still had a lot of currency in these decades. A very, very different perspective on Jane Austen. He never in this entire book uses the word spinster. He never calls attention to her unmarried state in that way. He never dwells on her not having married, and he really doesn't dwell particularly much on family stories about her love affairs. He just doesn't go there. And that baffled his reviewers. His reviewers said, ah, oh, the question that we all have about Jane Austen is how did she write these love stories when she never found love? We're still stuck with that question today. Um, Oscar Faye Adams just, he took a different vantage point on Jane Austen. And I think that might be because he himself had a different vantage point on love and marriage. That is a connection that I think is tenuous and it will be hard to bring sources to bear, but it does seem suggested from his writings. Now, he published a second edition, what was referred to on its title page as a new edition illustrated of the story of Jane Austen's life. And this is the same book. <laughs> Nothing has changed except the bibliography has additional sources. It comes up to date. And there are the illustrations that he wanted to have in the first volume. And let me say something about the images that I'm going to show you from this book, beginning with this really um, um, sad looking page there ripped ripped off to the left. This is not a book in Goucher's collection. This is in the public library, the Boston Public Library. It's the first such copy that I happened to look through when I was in Boston doing my research. And the Boston Public Library does not treat this as a rare book. It just treats it as an old book. So it's on the shelf. You can check it out. You can take it home. You don't put it in a cradle. You just hold it. Um, and that's what I did when I'm taking these pictures. Often when I have presentations like this, I crop photographs of pages really cl closely, so you're just focusing on the image. But I decided that it would serve our purposes better today to, to include a little bit so that you see, oh, this is in the book, right? This is always from a book. It's not just an image. It's an illustration in this particular book, in this particular copy. However, if you are not wanting to buy your own copy of the new edition illustrated of the story of Jane Austen's life, the way for you to read it with ease is to go to Hathi Trust dot org easier to find there than in google books um, and you can see the entire new edition illustrated there now this an interesting story about how adams brought about this second edition comes not from the publisher's records because they don't exist but from this very unusual source this is worth point is a source that some of you will know about it archives auction results 
for all kinds of things, including books. And whoever was buying, you know, whoever was selling this copy of the 1891, the first edition of Story of Jane Austen's Life, with letters tipped into it, um, put images of the book online when the book was auctioned, and those are still available now, might not always be, um, but are for now. And so it's through this unusual <laughs> research source, worth point, that I discovered what Oscar Fay Adams went through in order to get this book published. And this is what I mean about his hustle. So here's the transcription of the letter that you see. Dear Wynne, I have just bought the plates of my life of Jane Austen in order to save them from being melted up and have also purchased the remainder of the edition, 65 copies. So let me just interject plates, stereotyped plates. This is, um, oh, I can never explain this as, as concisely as I want to, um, but at this period of industrial publishing, type was set into, into plates, one for each page that could be reused if the book was republished in new editions. You wouldn't have to reset all the type, but when the publisher was not planning to print that book ever again, um, they would be, he says, melted up, you might say melted down and, and reused. Um, so Adams has made a real investment. He's bought the plates so he can carry them to a new publisher to get a second edition of his book. Um, we know what remainders are, same as we have today. Purchased the remainder of the edition, 65 copies. Mr. Gay, Eben Gay was the dedicatee of the biography, the person to whom Oscar Fay Adams dedicated it, advancing me the money to do so. So there you see. Even Gay was a wealthy Bostonian and a collector. He was able to help out his friend, Oscar Faye Adams, who was, didn't have enough money of his own to do that. If I can do so, I will sell the plates to some other publisher so that a second edition can be brought out here or in New York. But I want first to get these copies out of the way so as to leave the coast clear for another edition, as well as to partly clear my debt to Mr. Gay if I should have a delay in disposing of the plates. So I am offering them among my friends at 50 cents a piece. They retail at 125 thinking that at this price, they might be wanted for presents, et cetera. Mrs. Preston has subscribed for five, my friend Brackett for six and so on. Do you care to take one? Be sure to say no, like the good friend you are, if you don't for any reason think it best to take any. I find this letter unbelievably poignant because it's, it's so desperate. It's so desperate. And a connection that I made belatedly, you may already have made this connection yourself, but I made it belatedly this copy into which the letters were pasted this is one of the remaindered copies that this friend bought from adams to help him out that's why it has these letters in it so he was successful at least in this one case but he still had a lot of copies to get rid of he did succeed in placing the second edition of course and he did succeed in persuading the new publisher to include illustrations and so here is the list of what he was able to present to his readers in this later edition. Portrait of Jane Austen, that had been in the first edition too, but everything else was news. Facsimile letter of Jane Austen, Winchester Cathedral, Steventon, you know, on and on, Lyme, Bath, Lyme, Southampton, Winchester, etc. I'm going to show you just a couple of these, the ones I think are, are most interesting or might be most recognizable to you. But I want to start with this, what was captioned on the page, reduced facsimile of Miss Austen's writing because this is another first. Jane Austen's handwriting had been reproduced um, by her earlier biographers, but a complete letter in her handwriting had not until this until now. And the letter that Oscar Faye Adams used was given to him by Lord Brayburn, that editor of Austen's letters, expressly for the purpose of Adams using that letter in a, in a um, reduced facsimile. So Brayborn gave his blessing that Adams would be showing Austen's handwriting in this letter to the American audience. And Oscar Faye Adams got to keep the letter and he donated it to the Boston Authors Club of which he was a member, which I mentioned, which deposited it at the Boston Public Library. So the Boston Public Library where Special Collections has a Jane Austen letter, thanks to Oscar Faye Adams. And I want to say too, this was the second Jane Austen letter given by one of her family members, surviving descendants, to an American. And the first was given to the Quincy family of Cambridge and Boston, Massachusetts by Austin's brother, Frank Austin, Francis Austin, 
And that's the story that I tell in Reading Austin in America. So this truly is the next generation of Austin family members partnering with Americans, helping get the word out, helping share documents and material culture related to Austin. I, I confess, I have chosen the photos of the illustrations to show you in part to emphasize what Oscar Faye Adams saw and how different this looks from what you would see if you went to the pump room at Bath today. It's been restored. It doesn't look late Victorian anymore. So, you know, to what extent would an image like this in its 1890s glory, would that help you envision the world of Jane Austen in the 1810s? Hardly, maybe a little. It's, it's such, again, such a poignant effort to recapture a, a bygone time. Um, this one also I find just horrifying. The octagon at the upper assembly rooms at Bath in, in mid-Victorian or late Victorian um, splendor, I suppose. Would you say splendor? So we will, uh, one more from Bath, um, number four, Sydney Place, where the Austin family lived. And again, you can see how, how much pollution um, and weather have darkened the surface of the stone on that building. It looks very dark and dreary as opposed to how it would look how it does look today. And we will take a, take a break and look at a colorful photo. In 2017, the city of Bath paid tribute to Jane Austen with this remarkable thing. Um, I guess you would call it a garden installation. I don't know what you would call it. Um, a living tribute um, to Jane Austen. Oh, who can ever be tired of Bath? One of those misleading out of context quotations that doesn't really tell you a whole lot, but the pictures are, the flowers are pretty. All right. Couple more black and whites. Chawton House, at the time that Oscar Fay Adams visited it, was owned by that descendant Montague Knight, who had dedicated himself to the building's restoration. Montague Knight was, cared about Chawton House. He was a, a very important figure in the history of the house. And thanks to Montague Knight, Oscar Fay Adams was able to see not only the interior of Chawton House, but also family relics, possessions that no one had yet described for readers. Adams mentions in particular that he saw some of the family music books and portraits. Of course, recently, 2017, Chotten House, then Chotten House Library looked like this. Montague Knight, who as the owner of Chotten House also owned the building then known as Chotten Cottage, escorted Adams inside that building. So Adams had exceptional access. He was able to see inside. This is of course, long before the building was purchased and refitted to be a, a tourist museum. In this incarnation of it, it was lived in by laborers. And Adams notes when describing this in his, in his biography that a laborer's club occupies the room in which Austin once composed her novels, he wrote. As I entered the apartment where Mansfield Park, Emma and Persuasion were written, its sole occupant, a middle-aged laborer, looked up from the newspaper he was reading and courteously acknowledged the presence of his landlord, Mr. Knight, and myself. The place, now used as a club room, contains a billiard table and several substantial benches and chairs. Mugs of beer are now called for, where once the orange wine was sipped, and the London dailies form the literature of the room that aforetime contained the manuscripts of the six books upon which has securely rested the renown of the famous woman who lived and wrote therein. So this is an incredibly important eyewitness account of who was living in that building and how it was used and how, how that differed from its use during Jane Austen's time. Today, or rather 2017, when these beautiful artist benches were scattered across Hampshire, um, that is what the side of it looked like. And as many of us know very well, Jane Austen's house was opened as a museum in 1949 by the Jane Austen Trust in cooperation with the Jane Austen Society. Adams included this photograph of what he captioned as the house in College Street, Winchester, where Jane Austen died. Lots of fl floral window boxes at that point, remarkably. This is not quite, quite from the same angle, um, but there is the nicely repainted building in 2017. Adams was able to enter this building too in the company of the Dean of Winchester Cathedral. So another example of his unusual access. He was not just a literary pilgrim who went to the places that he knew that Austin had lived and looked at them. 
that he he gained access so that he could describe the insides and so he could describe his own feelings and his reflections on being there. And finally, this is the stained glass window memorial to Jane Austen in Winchester Cathedral. It's kind of like, it's kind of memorial on top of memorial. So if you've been to Winchester Cathedral, you know that the gravestone slab for Austen, which does not mention that she was an author, is in the aisle. And over the years, different family members in conjunction with others added first this brass memorial here that you can barely see, and then this, this beautiful stained glass window with a little explanation of it um, in order to commemorate her further and explain more explicitly why she deserves commemoration because she was an author and, and wrote books. In the late 1890s, Adams's English acquaintances, the ones who had helped him with the biography, whom he had stayed in contact with, showed their trust in him by enlisting him as a fundraiser in America for a long planned memorial to Austin. This had been in the works for years to be placed in Winchester Cathedral. He made efforts, including a letter to the editor of the periodical, The Critic, in which he enclosed an appeal from the London Times that was signed by that same Montague Knight, owner of Chawton House. And in that letter, Adams attested, Mr. Knight, one of the grand nephews of Jane Austen is personally known to me. And it is at his request that I have undertaken to bring this matter to the knowledge of American admirers of Jane Austen's genius. And in another letter to the periodical, The Churchman, Adams explained that he was asked, quote, as the American biographer of Miss Austen, to solicit and forward American subscriptions to the London bankers' whores. And the bank's ledger that has survived shows that Adams collected 65 pounds towards the total cost of 301 pounds for the window. So here, a lasting tribute to Jane Austen, a memorial to her, and also a lasting recognition for Adams's connectedness and his stature, his status and his stature as the American biographer of Jane Austen at that point. And here in 2017 were some of the floral tributes placed below the brass plaque at, at, at the base of that memorial window. So where's this all heading? <laughs> what comes next? My book, Americans for Austin, I hope, fingers crossed, will be forthcoming in 2023. And I'm also happy to tell you to mark your calendars for 2025, the magnificent 250th birthday of Jane Austen. I am going to be the guest cur co-curator of an exhibition that doesn't have a title yet, but it will be a major show with international loans, as well as lots of the manuscripts and letters and other documents from the Morgan's collection at the Morgan Library and Museum in New York City, which is the place to which Alberta Burke, our Goucher Austin collector, donated the manuscripts that she owned. It is, I think, it is the public institution that has the most Austin manuscripts anywhere in the world, certainly on the side of the Atlantic. And we're still in the, it will take us years, I think, to get permission to bring all the items that we would love to show to Americans as we celebrate Austin, but we have a commitment that we will be able to feature Jane Austen's pelisse, sometimes called her pelisse coat, uh, which has not traveled outside of England before. It will be on display in America for the first time. Many of you have seen images of this. Many of you will own bags and items and notebooks um, with the beautiful oak leaf pattern of it. It is so worth seeing in person. It gives such a sense of Jane Austen's personal elegance and her stature in, in terms of height. But as we think about her style and her importance, her stature in terms of her literary stature, it is a marvelous object to, to be able to, to feature and center. And in the meantime, I hope I have whetted your appetite to go on Google Books or Happy Trust or find your own copies in libraries or, or buy one and go explore chapters from Jane Austen and the story of Jane Austen's life for yourself and spread the word. Oscar Faye Adams is really rewarding, but just steer clear of his poetry and short stories. But I shouldn't end on that note. He's really rewarding. He did great work for Austen and he deserves all the attention that we can give him. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. That's it. And I welcome your comments and questions. Um, Susie, we didn't talk about, do you want to, 
relay these or do you want me yes. to then? I'll relay okay. the questions. Okay, great. So um, the first question we had a while back was about, if you could talk a little bit more about what is on display um, at Goucher, what, what can the public view at Goucher um, from the Jane Austen collection? Thank you. This is a wonderful question. I really appreciate your asking it. We are not a museum. So there is nothing on display currently unless you come and ask us to bring things out and display them for you in our special collections reading room. And this is something that we want to change because we do often get requests from visitors to come see the Jane Austen collection. Well, the Jane Austen collection contains thousands of items that live in climate controlled stacks. So you won't, no one will be able to see the whole thing, but we are happy to bring out, my library colleagues are, and I are happy, happy to help you see representative items. Um, but we are working now, beginning with an Austin seminar class that I'm teaching this spring on having students involved with mini exhibitions, like one glass case that students can think, what items would we want to put in this case and how would we explain them so that whenever anyone comes, there will be at least one case that they can see. And I truly hope over time that we can, we can expand um, from there and we can do right by these materials and display more of them. Um, my preservationist colleague would, would be on my back if I didn't say none of these materials can be displayed all the time, but certainly they can be rotated. They can be rotated out. And I would add too, this is why having our website to build on is so important to us as well, because the, the more that we can digitize, the more you in New Zealand, you in Montana, you in wherever, you know, can see some of our resources. It is extremely, it is special, both in a hand on heart kind of way to see the original materials in person. And there's also information that you can get from an in-person encounter that you cannot get with a flat digital image on the screen. So it's worth coming. Um, but in, we want to be able to complement that experience with more digitally. Thank you. Um, another question, why couldn't Monica Unite have just come up with a 301 pounds on his own uh, for the stained glass window? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, what a great question. I mean, I mean, <laughs> How to say this without sounding totally snarky and offensive. Maybe I'll just risk it. Then as now, English people have always looked hopefully towards Americans <laughs> and our pockets and you know hoped that we will help them with their buildings and their windows and everything else. And we generally have, and JASNA members continue to be very generous, um, both personally and JASNA as an institution towards Austin sites. I don't, you know, it's, I go through these projects and I, I, I feel like I'm always peering through a keyhole and sometimes my keyhole is just Jane Austen. So you wrote other stuff, but I don't really care if it doesn't have anything to do with Jane Austen. And sometimes my keyhole is, is my historical subject, my person. So I'm interested in what Oscar Faye Adams did with respect to the window. Someone else needs to write the whole history of the window and look for all the archival sources and the back and forth. Like I'm sure that people said very entertaining things behind the scenes, but I always have to, I have to put limits <laughs> on my own project or it becomes bigger than any publisher will ever publish or bigger than I, that I could ever finish. So I'm doubtless there are stories to discover. Um, how did Adams uh, acquire uh, his network of resources and people? How did he make those connections, introductions to the family? What a great question. He was very accustomed to cold writing writing to people cold to ask for things because his reference books i mentioned a brief handbook of english authors he also had a brief handbook of american authors and those each went through many editions and when he was writing about a deceased an author of the past he did his library research but when he was writing about an author of the present he got that person's address if he could and wrote to them directly um, so there's a, a letter from him that survives in the collections at the Folger Shakespeare Library of all uh, unsurprising places, because the person that Adams was writing to was someone who had written about Shakespeare. And so we have this one example of, of this kind of letter that, that Adams must have written hundreds of, where he says, you know, dear so-and-so, I, I would like to include you in my brief handbook. Can you please tell me, what is your address? How do you pronounce your name? You know, can you... Can you can you verify the facts about you? Um, but how he got those those addresses in the first place, I, 
I presume he wrote to publishers. I mean, he was just he was a really hard worker. And with the Austin family too, he, how he found out the first person to write to, I don't know, but once he had one, then he ingratiated himself. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way at all, but we, we do in, in the few letters that have survived, there's lots of, well, the next time you come, I have to introduce you to my cousin, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, this person will want to see you, or it's clear that English people are offering him introductions to other English people as he as he goes. And it's clear from the letters that have survived that, that those folks really did respect him, almost all of them. The novelist Charlotte Young, he met her, and then she subsequently wrote a couple of letters saying, this funny little American came to visit last summer. He's, what a strange man. He wanted to talk about Miss Austin. But in <laughs> general, the letters that survive suggest, you know, that he was serious of purpose and that he, he really, I mean, it, it was not, how to, I'm just gonna start that sentence over again. By no means was it, no, that sentence, it's not gonna work either. Um, why is this hard to say? It's not a difficult thought. Um, the fact that Austin family descendants trusted Adams was not a given at all. It was, you know, here's somebody saying, I'm coming to visit and I'm gonna write a biography of Jane Austen. Like that was not something that would necessarily have brought out helpfulness and trust. So he must have been lovely in person. He must have been great to talk to, um, fun to go in Chatton Cottage with as well. And that aspect of him is hard to recapture, unfortunately. I'll try. Here's another question. Was he considered part of any society of Austin scholars in his time? He would have made a great JASNA member. He would have <laughs> loved JASNA. But those, those organizations didn't exist at all. Um, Devaney Loser has done the most and writing about gentlemen's clubs and Jane Austen, you know, late 19th century, early 20th, 20th century. Um, before the Jane Austen Society, UK, was founded in 1940, there, there was no official organization of any kind and still is no organization specific for scholars of Jane Austen. It's true that in Oscar Faye Adams' lifetime, scholarship on English literature and what would have been considered modern English literature, meaning, you know, of our century, rather than, for example, the that scholarship was just, just, just starting. Oscar Faye Adams was a little too early. That's one of the reasons that he hasn't received the lasting recognition, because he was writing critical editions, critical biography before people were doing that or, or necessarily um, recognized what was important about that. I said, he didn't teach at Harvard. You know, he had yeah. friends and acquaintances who were hard, but that was not him. Um, and do you have any insights into how he got interested in Jane Austen? Um, how he did. Um, I love to ask that question of subjects and you are really at the mercy of what has survived in terms of archival materials. There is the detail and I, I thought it might be too boring to include in the talk. So I'll try to make it unboring right now. The first published writing of of Oscar Faye Adams is about Austin is his entry for her in the brief handbook of English authors. And I combed through that, <laughs> trying to get everything out of it that I could. And one of the sources that he mentions there is a magazine article from the Atlantic from 20 years before. And that magazine article was by Anna Quincy Waterston, one of the Quincy families, um, one, a member of the Quincy family. And I wrote about Anna and her literary pilgrimage and her afternoon with Frank Austin and her Atlantic Monthly article in Austin and America. So that to me, it's tiny, but it's it's a connecting thread, not only in my own work, but it shows, oh, Oscar Faye Adams was the kind of person 20 years later who cared about an American who had gone to England herself, had seen places herself, had met family members herself, had done that kind of work. And he wants his own readers 20 years later of English authors to know about that piece of writing because he could have referred to any number of essays, but he chose that one. So it's tiny and we don't have the reasons behind it because if he kept a diary that hasn't survived, you know, so many of his letters haven't survived. Gosh, gosh, gosh. Um, yeah, it's not the time when anybody would have been assigned Jane Austen in school. This is another answer to that question from a slightly different perspective. The very fact that 
Adams was hired to write the book chapters from Jane Austen it's because Jane Austen was not necessarily well known among young people and Adams is trying to interest young people in her um, just like his counterpart who wrote about Walter Scott was trying to interest young people in Scott so again many of you are with Janine Barkas's work and her book The Lost Books of Jane Austen on all of the the mass um, mass published editions of Austen that had not been included in official bibliographies, but are a very important part of the story and the history of how Austen has been published and read. Those exist, and so do all of these sources that reiterate that Jane Austen, right now, she seems like she's from a bygone age, young people are not interested in her, boy, she's so prim. So Oscar Faye Adams was really doing a lot of work promoting her and that aspect of the biography that I stressed where he's he's saying she wasn't a prim poor spinster, <laughs> you know, she was a happy, satisfied, purposeful author. That's all part of his effort to interest his own contemporaries in the 1880s and 1890s in someone who he anticipated would seem to them like a woman from the past, way back then, not that interesting necessarily. That is all a long answer to say, you know, you wouldn't have been reading Jane Austen in school. How did he come to her? I, we're unlikely to know, would love to know, of course. This is a related question. It also calls for speculation, but um, did he believe he would make a living with this pursuit? Well, he made a living. <laughs> he made a living with all this kind of writing. Um, oh gosh, I mean, letters that are hard to read. The one publisher's archives, is archives is our an archive of publishers records that is very complete is the Scribner's archive at Princeton University and I was there for a, a different project and I looked in their finding aid and saw that they had a few Oscar Faye Adams letters so I looked at those while I was there oh and they're they're desperately sad to read he was trying to get someone to publish a book on English cathedrals based on the description he had written in his travels and you know, there's his, we would call it a query letter. There's his book proposal and letter form. And on the top is someone at the publishing firm wrote no in really big letters. And then he followed up later. He's like, did you get my proposal for the English? I mean, it, clearly people were telling him no all the time. And he just, he just, um, so yeah, it's interesting for us to think about a minor man of letters of the time, you know, somebody who published a lot of books, but who was not making a lot of money from, from any of them. And so in the absence of a professor salary or any other kind of institutional job, you know, he just had to keep tracking. The second chapter of the book that I'm writing about is about William Dean Howells, who is much better remembered as an ardent Janeite. And Howells was a best-selling author. He was a wealthy man. He had houses here, houses there. He and Adams knew each other through the Boston Authors Club and through literary circles. And I, I think of William Dean Howells as being this kind of, you know, prosperous man of letters and Oscar Faye Adams as being, you know, really kind of on the edge and, and just, you know, having to work all the time in order to keep, keep going. So no, Jane Austen did not make him wealthy, nor did his regrettable poetry. <laughs> uh, speaking of... <laughs> Wealth. Uh, some uh, Rosanna Anderson has converted the three hundred one um, pounds to nineteen thousand. I think is that in today's dollars. So, lot. Um, I mean, it's a big, beautiful window. It is. Lovely. Yeah. It is lovely. Uh, another person is asking about how far in advance to. This goes back to Goucher. How far in advance should they request to see the original materials if they're coming to Baltimore? As far as possible, and again, more information is on on the website, but because we are an undergraduate institution and we are small in scale, um, we, we are not able to offer access on weekends usually, um, usually weekdays, um, but we try to accommodate requests and welcome, we especially welcome JASNA groups when we're able to bring you know, a, a group from your region, but we're certainly able to welcome individual travelers and, and, and pairs, but yeah, let us know let us know of your desire and we will work with you and, and help make it possible if, if we can. Right. This is an interesting question. What do you think of the scholarly accuracy and insights in his book, his books? 
the scholarly, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear. The accuracy and insights that he offers. I did cherry pick a little bit from this presentation to make him sound good, because that's in keeping with my effort, but do encourage you to go in and read him. Not everything that he says about Austin, you know, we would say, wow, that has, that really makes sense today. Um, but I think he's, he's pretty good, especially if you read his contemporaries, many of whom, you know, Jane Austen, even if they didn't necessarily think they were doing it. He's really, he's always focused on what creative writing students today would call her craft. He's always focused on how she does what she does and his commentary on her, on her characters. Almost all of it, I think, Jasna members would, would just be, you know, nodding along as you read it. He's, he's, his rights hold up. And what do you think of his writing style? <laughs> Again, I cherry picked a little bit. Look, 18th century, sorry, he's a late 19th century American author. So he's going to have sentences where you just, you know, you kind of turn your head a little bit, but truly he has fewer of those sentences. Um, I was, look, I will be completely honest with you all. I was dreading the story of Jane Austen's life because I thought it was going to be terrible. I was like, oh, it's, a, it's the first, it's so important. Now I have to read it. And it was much, much more engaging and entertaining than I expected, and much less kind of purple prose, late 19th century. It does have some moments that are a little bit sentimental, but I think it's much stronger biographical writing about Austen than a lot of popular writing about Austen today. Not just not naming any names, but I think it did pretty well. Uh, another question is, what other early biographies came after that? What other notable ones would you, so yeah, on Austin, I believe, but I'm not 100% sure. Right. I had considered putting this in the presentation and I cut it for time. Um, so R.W. Chapman gets the credit, first critical edition of Jane Austen, although his wife should also get some credit. The person who eclipsed Oscar Faye Adams in biography, people were Constance and Ellen Hill. And many of you will know Jane Austen, her home and her friends from, I believe, 1902. Very charming. Um, travelogue by English sisters. One sister drew the illustrations. Um, it was published in English, it was published in the US. It went into multiple editions. People just loved it. And the Hills got more access to more places than Adams had, in part, I think, because they were English, in part, because they were you know, 12, 14 years later, it was just different. And everyone remembers their book. And almost no one remembers that Oscar Faye Adams was there first. And that in addition to describing her homes and haunts, that kind of writing, he also had the full apparatus of the critical biography, which the Hills don't. I mean, they have, they integrate discussion of Austin's novels if memory serves, but they're not, they're not trying to do the whole um, synthesize prior sources, bibliography, all the critical biography apparatus that I was describing. But yeah, they're the ones who are remembered and Oscar Faye Adams is not. Okay. Um, were his literary handbooks used as school or college text for general reading or for general reading? You know, it is often really hard to tell how books were used. You can see how books were intended to be used. You can see how editors addressed their audiences, but a good question like that would be, could be a real challenge to research, like who used these books. One way to go at it would be to find as many copies as you could and, you know, look for ownership signatures, see if there are books that were form copies that were formerly owned by school libraries. Again, I, I can't do it myself right now, but you can, you can see all the ways there's a kind of ripple effect, like you can ask interesting questions that, that go out here, 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 or there, there, there. So I, I entrust someone to tell the whole story of the stained glass window and like who actually read and used chapters of Jane Austen. What I do have and what I'm including in the book is information from reviews of both chapters from Jane Austen and the story of Jane Austen's life. Remember that picture of Oscar Faye Adams's deadly dull looking scrapbook? 
his scrapbook is a gold mine. He had a clipping service sent him all the reviews of all of his books. And so right there, all in one place, you know, you, it's possible to, to synthesize all the, these responses and reactions. And he received a lot of praise, not only praise, but a lot of praise. And from newspapers throughout the US, not just East Coast, big newspapers, but, you know, smaller, more local, more regional papers elsewhere in the country. Um, do you know how long his travels to England were when he was on his, his you know, back oh, missions? He says summer. I mean, I think a month or two. He can't have had a lot of money. I don't, I'm not exactly sure how he funded it. I mean, imagine since he published chapters from Jane Austen in 1888, 89, and then he was in England the next summer. I mean, you might imagine that he, he applied that money um, to his, his travel. But again, since we don't have boxes and boxes of his, there's his financial records, all kinds of, of questions that we're like, I don't know. Don't think that probably, probably we aren't gonna know. Maybe. Um, speaking of things we don't really know, a couple of people commented that married, unmarried men of the time might not have married, not because they were gay, but because they didn't want to have the expense of a wife and the inevitable children. Do you have any insights on that as a possibility? Sure. I mean, as I said, I have these dozen or so, I have, Harvard has these dozen or so very intimate sounding letters that Oscar Faye Adams wrote to George Edward Woodbury definitely was, I'm not sure how, what he would have said of himself, but he was definitely oriented towards other men. Was Adams in what sense? How to talk about this respectfully? I don't know. But if I had not read those dozen letters, I would not be going there at all with Oscar Faye Adams. Having read those dozen letters, it's like, whoa, I have to try to say something and not overstep and be appropriate. Um, so I'm still still researching historical context and an effort to, to think through that, that piece of the puzzle. Uh, what was Alberta Burke's sense of knowledge of Oscar Faye Adams? Do you have, do you know? Oh, not much. It's a good question. Our books, um, one of the substantial donations that Goucher received of early and rare editions and books was from Barbara Wynne Adams, a collector who is an alumna of Smith. And she died in the 1990s and the Smith librarian consulted with her and suggested that she give her, her collection to Goucher, not to Smith, which is the nicest and most generous thing that any librarian has ever done. Um, and I believe, I would have to double check, but I believe that the copies of Oscar Faye Adams that we have are Barbara Wynne Adams's collection. Burks. The thing with Alberta Burke is that although she did give to Goucher a lot of professional correspondence, she kept records of the books and manuscripts that she bought. She has the back and forth of her dealers, lots of records of that nature. Um, and though she wrote in the margins of her scrapbooks and in the margins of her books, her responses to some of what she read or heard on the radio, she did not keep a diary and she did not donate personal papers to Goucher. So there's a lot about Alberta Burke as a human being, um, as opposed to an expert scholarly Austin collector that we don't know. She is the fourth and last chapter of the book that I'm working on and drawing on letters that she wrote to this English friend whom I mentioned early on, Averill Hassel, bring a lot of questions that we had had about her love of Jane Austen, but, you know, luck of the draw, what she happened to mention in this set of letters that we were fortunate to receive. And I don't, to my knowledge, she did not record thoughts about Oscar Faye Adams, but I can certainly go and look again. It's always worth, worth opening the books and looking again. Um, how are we doing on time? We have a lot more questions. I want to, you know, do you have a little more time? <laughs> oh, I'm, and please, if we don't answer your question today, um, send me an email. I'm going to put my email address in the chat. I'm going to attempt to put my email address in the chat. And everyone, that's what we want. Juliet Wells at Goucher. 
edu. And I will gladly give it back to you if we don't get question. We have a few more minutes, though. Sure. OK. Um, a couple of people ask about the scrapbook. What, what did it look like? Was it all Austin material? I mean, you showed us an image, but. Yeah, it's it's a lot of Austin. It's not only Austin. Um, so of course, I paid the most attention to the Austin pages. And so I don't, if you ask me, well, what else was in there and how much of it, then I, I look a little blank. Um, but he had a clipping service sending him any mentions of himself or his books. A book that he had some notoriety for writing, again, nothing made him financially secure and successful because nothing did. He wrote a series of essays that were then collected in a book with the title, The Presumption of Sex. and his essays were about manners and these are not his best writing and I wouldn't recommend them in a completist and they might put you off his writing about Jane Austen. but he he wrote you know really kind of vitriolically against women and then against men um, for their manners in the present day and these were collected in the presumption of sex and briefly had some notoriety for this he was interviewed um, so that his, his scrapbook also includes copies of, of some of the publicity um, for that, that book as well. But mostly he just, he seemed to care. He wanted to know how his books were reviewed and what, and what people thought of them. He has a letter. Um, so he wrote his, his very emotionally intimate letters to George Edward Woodbury early on. And then the two of them had a quick exchange of letters late in Adams's life in 1913. And Adams wrote to him and, and said, I think the best writing that I have done, my work is, and this Austin's life was one of the works that he mentioned. But he also mentioned one of his books of terrible, terrible short stories. So, yeah. Um, so Adam's books are not listed in Chapman's bibliography. Why do you think that is? Chapman's bibliography? Um, since 1953, 1955. Yeah, I mean, David Gilson's bibliography, 1982, 1997, is the most complete of its type. Of course, you know, it was out of date the moment it was printed, and Gilson had some blind spots in what he looked for as well. It's never the case that British biographers know of or include every American source. Um, and I would have to go back and look at Chapman's bibliography. I don't have it on my shelf behind me to see how thorough it was in terms of A, American sources, and B, sources of the, the nature of Adams's work, which is not, they are not scholarly in a typical sense. So R.W. Chapman was very concerned with a kind of scholarly academic presentation of Austin's publication and reception. and. I'm making the case that Adams deserves to be seen through that light, but it's taken till me to make the case. So Chapman was definitely not making that case himself in the 1950s. This is, uh, this is from Jason Solinger. Uh, so he says, Oscar Faye Adams is the type of man of letters of mid 20th century critics uh, love to disparage. Have you considered <laughs> the ways in which writers like Adams provided a foil against which those critics in the 40s and 50s define themselves? That is another great project that someone else I think will need to do. Um, so I think, my I think Jason's is, doing that. I think that's why <laughs> he oh, is good. asking Thank selfishly. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm carrying my figures, you know, through the end of their lives with some attention to um, like whether the work they did had influence or impact in their lifetime or beyond, um, and what that was and how we would think of it now. Um, and with four chapters, I am not writing the complete history by any means of, of American scholarship on Austin or advocacy for Austin. So there's tons, tons, tons of space left. And again, having to set limits on a project so that it's, it's manageable um, means not as much opportunity as I would like to place authors like Adams fully in the context of their predecessors, their contemporaries, and their successors. But I can say quickly that, um, again, someone who got more, someone who was a credentialed academic scholar, um, William Phelps, 
of Yale wrote a very short book about Jane Austen in the early and he offered Adams recognition. He recommended that people read Adams's biography and he, he gave it his professorial stamp of approval. So at least Adams was aware, again, aware at least to a little degree that his work had had staying power beyond you know, the year of its evolution. But it, it really is the case in these early decades of academic disciplines that people aren't necessarily systematic in what they consult and they aren't necessarily, um, how to say it. Like if you're, if you're establishing a discipline, you're not, you don't necessarily, you're not gonna acknowledge everybody. I'm Dick and Harry without a PhD, you're not. And it's, I wish it weren't true, but it's, it's true in the world of Austin studies today and in all academic disciplines and not everyone is super generous. Some people are, you know, sticking their claim and, and elbows out. So, but it's easy to imagine that Oscar Faye Adams with a teaching college degree, no PhD, no academic affiliation, that he was not going to get full recognition and respect from a Yale professor like Phelps, an English a professor in England like R.W. Chapman. Like it, they just had no reason to give him that respect. Um, what was he doing in North Truro when he died? No clue, no documentation. I have, I'm, I'm able to tell, I'm able to provide only a really skeletal um, biography. Like this is again, I where I think of like the keyhole, like Os I'm concerned with Oscar Fay items and Jane Austen, public Austen, which were for a kind of public reading course called the Book Lovers magazine, but I, I don't think it's worth anyone, it would be worth anyone's while to try to write a full scale biography of him. I just don't think he's, he's interesting because of his work on Jane Austen. He matters now because of his work on Jane Austen. I don't think anyone could make the case that he matters more broadly than that. And I would, unless there are troves of archival material somewhere that I haven't found, which I would be surprised if there are troves, there's probably like a letter here and there, you know, in lots of places, but it, you just can't tell the life story of a historical person um, year to year, beginning to end, unless you have, unless you have sources. I think we'll have one more question and I apologize to anybody whose question I missed, but um, there's a question, what is the third chapter in your new book? Ooh, thank you. Um, Charles Beecher Hogan, Yale collector who owned the Topaz Crosses. Um, that was his big claim to fame as a collector. And and he donated them to Jane Austen's house in the 1970s, where they are, where many of us have seen them on our, our visits. And he was a scholarly collector as well. He owned one of the six known copies of the 1816 Philadelphia Emma, about which I wrote in Reading Austen in America. And he left most of all to Yale. And so again, it's like you can't, I'm not going to try to tell the entire story of his life, but I want to tell the story of his work as an Austin collector um, and bibliographer and scholar. And he is, he's an almost direct counterpart with Alberta Burke. They were both born in 1906, but Hogan, and they both had master's degrees in literature, but Hogan went in a, in a more academic route, taught at Yale though, as a research faculty member, it was definitely a second, Yale faculty would have considered him a kind of second tier faculty in the English department. Um, but his his acquisition ownership of the topaz crosses um, is a, a really good story to tell and has not been fully told. Great. Julia, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. I want to read all about I want to read all of this work now. All right, I want to get it done. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. If everybody wants all. to unmute, you can say a little thank you. It's like a um, yes. hooray, and we appreciate it. Thank you. These are terrific questions and I really appreciate the opportunity to hear what you were thinking. And I encourage you to go forth and do all these wonderful projects. Thanks so much, Julia. Thanks everybody Thank for you. coming. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.